Hello, welcome back to History of Wine and the Vine. I'm Emily Kate. Today we're going to talk a little bit about ancient Greece. So we'll be discussing why they were drinking wine in ancient Greece, what the role of wine was in the culture of ancient Greece, and then we'll discuss how they made wine. So why were the people of ancient Greece drinking wine? Because the water was dirty. It was very unsafe and chancy to drink the water in ancient Greece. And so people had the wine because it was just healthier for them. And they did believe it had medicinal benefits, but it just simply wouldn't get you sick at the same rate that water would. With everything, there's obviously an economic component as well. So in the very beginning, there were these farmers who simply had enough vines um, to provide uh, wine for their family and that was it. But with the kind of Athens and Sparta and the the um, growth of these cities, it became a business to make wine to service the cities. There were these new markets, new demand. And so on an economic basis, there became the role of the vintner and somebody who had to make wine for everybody and sell it. Um, Something pretty interesting about uh, wine in the big cities in Greece is that they had these crazy laws and um, so there was a law that you couldn't uh, buy wine in an open container, not like our open container law, you couldn't actually buy it in an open container. Um, you couldn't uh, buy wine that was already watered down. You had to watch if you were in like a tavern or something in one of the cities. You had to be able to see um, the barkeep actually ladle out your wine. They couldn't do it like behind a closed door, or behind a screen. You had to see everything. So get the historian wheels clicking, what that means is there was a lot of fraud going on with wine in ancient Greece. So it's just kind of something interesting to think about. And then next we'll discuss the culture. Wine played a huge role in Greek culture and what I wanted to discuss was the difference between the ancient Roman drinking culture and the ancient Greek drinking, drinking culture because you might have heard some of the same terms being thrown around and I just wanted to make uh, the difference very clear. So in ancient Rome you had um, Bacchus was the wine god and you had the convivium which if you'll um, remember if you watched the ancient Rome video, if you didn't go watch it, um, they had these conviviums which were these massive banquets with lots of acrobats and really fun things um, and they had different wine with each course and they, they had everything with food, that was a huge deal. Um, but the kind of counterpart, which is the symposium in Greece, would happen after a meal and it was raucous and there were there was just a lot of drinking, not a lot of food. Um, it was a time for discussion and poetry and it was said, the reason that I think that wine was included, there's a quote that says, the wine is means to see through a man. This is an ancient Greek quote. Um, and they kind of had this separation of regular life and the symposium and the wine was kind of a social lubricant. It had the ability to get people discussing things and they shared poetry together. I think it's pretty interesting. Like I said, there was this divide between the symposium and everything else in ancient Greece. So when you went to a symposium, it wasn't just a regular hanging out with your friends discussing poetry. It was in a specific room when you went in, you had to wash your hands. You had to put on a wreath on your head. So there were lots of different ways that said, this is different, this is specifically a symposium, and a lot of great things happened at them. Um, and the last thing is that whereas you had the um, convivium versus the symposium, you also have in ancient Rome, you had Bacchus, and here in ancient Greece, you have Dionysus. So Dionysus is the Greek counterpart to Bacchus, is the Greek uh, wine god. So I hope that this clarified a few things between ancient Greece and ancient Rome. So we know a lot about the culture uh, of drinking in ancient Greece because of uh, the Iliad and Plato's Symposium, but we also know through artifacts, which is actually really interesting. So there's this coin from Mend, and um, essentially on one side of the coin you have Dionysus and he's reclining with a cup of wine, um, and then on the other side of the coin you have a um, depiction of a, a vineyard scene. So in this scene there are these like very small squat uh, vines and that presents one image, but then there's also an attic vase found around 550 BC and that shows 
tree trunks um, and then the vines run, winding around the tree trunk. So these are supported vines that are up uh, trellised. Um, and then there are stakes coming up from the ground and the vines are also um, expanding along those stakes. So you have a lot of different um, different representations of what a vineyard scene might have looked like, uh, but both equally possible because there's a lot of variation within uh, Greece. So the mountainous uh, mainland has uh, calcareous soil and then in the islands, the Greek islands, there's a lot of volcanic soil. So there's a lot of variation within Greek wines um, and that's as evidenced by the soil types and by the different representations that we get of the tactics that people used in vineyards back in the ancient times. Okay, so as you can see, I have some new additions to my table. I'm going to be discussing now how they made wine in ancient Greece, and I've enlisted the help of some props. So uh, this is just a um, bowl with some holes at the bottom, and then something, a, a matching bowl to catch whatever comes out of there. This is a cup of vinegar. I don't know if you can see, a cup of vinegar. Um, and then I just have a wine glass for drinking. So I'm going to explain the process that they made wine in ancient Greece and I'm going to demonstrate over here. I'm not going to step on the grapes, I'm just going to crush them. So I'm going to use just, oh that's useful, so I'm just going to use um, a couple of grapes as an example. Not all of them. Um, so first what they did was they brought in the grapes from the vineyard and they put them on the treading floor. This is the treading floor and um, they crush them, so here goes. It's not easy, these are, uh, these are eating grapes, not necessarily uh, grapes for crushing. <laughs> okay, so what's coming out now is what we would call kind of that free run juice, that first, um, first press juice, and what the ancient Greeks called it was glucose. So that's kind of funny because we call it, that's what we call sugar, glucose. So what they did was they would take the glucose and let's see if I have any, okay I have a little bit but not enough. I will keep uh, mashing. What they did was they took the glucose and instead of putting all of it um, to be fermented, they took part of it out Okay, I must have enough now. Okay, I have a, a good amount now. Um, so what they did was, they took some of it out and put it in a cup for drinking. And so as you can see, not a lot of it, but here is some mashed up um, grape juice, glucose, and they added a little bit of vinegar to clarify it. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of vinegar because I don't have that much ju juice and we will see what happens. So I don't see a lot of clarifying going on, um, but I will try it and I'll let you know how it was. It's actually not bad. I thought it was gonna be really gross, but it's not bad. Um, so that's part of what they did with the glucose. The other part, what they did with the glucose, um, which if you'll remember is just what comes out here, uh, is that they boiled it. So they simmered it and they turned it into something called hepsema, which is essentially like grape jelly. So this kind of condensed grape jelly, it was good for two reasons. Well, I'm sure it was good, but it was good for two reasons within the winemaking process. So they could add it in before fermentation, and what it was is it's a concentration of sugar. So this would have made the resulting alcohol way, uh, the resulting wine way higher in alcohol um, if they had included it before fermentation. Because if you'll remember, fermentation is yeast and sugar, and it yields carbon dioxide, alcohol, and um, and heat. So. Um, they would do that before fermentation, but after fermentation, they could add in the hepsima as a sweetener to make a, an already fermented wine um, taste sweeter and have more body. Because if you remember, it was kind of like a jelly flavor, um, a jelly consistency. So that's what they would do with this. But in order to drink it, they would actually clarify it with vinegar. So um, they would put these in something called pithoi. And that would be where the fermentation would happen. 
Um, these could be buried in the ground or um, they could be upright. And then what they did was when they covered it, they covered it with a lid that they actually rubbed with herbs or pine cones, um, something to impart some flavor. And they kept a very close watch on the fermenting um, juice. It was fermented for nine days, more or less. And um, they kept a really good watch on it and they would constantly draw off of the top and make sure that everything was clean and tasted delicious. So I hope that this kind of clarified a few things for you. Um, I'm seeing it visually, I'll show you this. Oh gosh. And I hope that that helped, uh, will help you remember what it was. Um, and we'll get on to the tasting. Okay, so for today's tasting, it's a kind of cool recipe. You might think it sounds a little bit gross. And I'm going to use this wine here. This is the easiest uh, corkscrew I've ever used. It's called Screw Pull by Le Creuset. Um, so, Everything about this tasting is very special today. I have this lovely wine, which was a gift from a good friend of mine. Um, and it's from Greece, obviously. And um, it actually has on the back, it actually has on the back, um, I'll read it to you. Pentopolis was a conglomerate of five city-states which has been populated since 5,500 BC. The city is surrounded by the rich and in gold mountain Pagio, and the sacred Mount Ethos. The cultivation of vine dates back in ancient times. The vine, which is labeled Pentopolis, is dedicated to the viticulturists of all time in this region, and it makes us travel throughout time back to the ecstatic festivities in honor of the god Dionysus, who was born here in this region called Thrace. So really lovely because it's a historical, you know, feeling wine. And so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna pour a bit in here. And then we're going to follow a recipe that sounds a little crazy. In this jar right here, I have seawater. I actually went to the beach, put this in the ocean, and grabbed some seawater. And we're going to try out how it tastes, try to see how it tastes. I can open it. Um, in the wine. So when I read about this, I thought it sounded a little bit strange. Um, but it seems to be the rule of thumb is one part seawater to four parts um, wine. So let's see. Okay, here we go. This is seawater and wine from Greece. It's like meaty somehow, even though it's so white. Um, and you know, it's actually not that rare that people put in seawater. They also put in salt. And a lot, a lot of the wines of ancient times were just watered down. I mean, up until like 20 parts of water to one part of wine. So watering things down was definitely not rare. So, okay, I'm, there's a beautiful kind of golden color. It smells... I kind of can't get past the, um, the seawater. Um, it's maybe kind of citrusy. It's delicious. Here, I don't know if you guys were able to see, but I'll just show you the bottle. This lovely bottle I get from our friend David. Um, <laughs> I can't say I would suggest that anybody do this. Uh, if you're looking for a nice drinking wine, um, if you are trying to play a prank on somebody, maybe, but... It's extremely salty. Um, maybe not uh, something that we should do nowadays that much. I think there's a reason why it, why it went out of fashion. Um, but always interesting to taste these uh, different recipes nonetheless. So let me know if you try this. I know I've done a great advertisement for it, but let me know if you've tried this um, or if you have any other kind of wine, ancient recipes that you'd like to see um, be done here. And until next time, cheers!